You know, just learning that better than 90% of the people in the country do not achieve real financial competence and security during their lives gives each of us, as head of his family, or at least co-head, the responsibility to make certain that we are in that small percentage of people who do. As George Bernard Shaw said one time, it is the duty of every man, the first duty of every man, is not to be poor. As it is written in the nature of man, freedom must be gained specifically against the obstacles and the conditions to which we're constantly exposed. And two, achieving financial security is an excellent exercise in creative imagination. Considering the effects of unrelenting inflation and assuming that they will continue in the future as they have in the past, estimate how much money you think you and your spouse will need as income to live as you want to live at the time you pick for retirement. Now, if you want to go along with age 65, that's fine, but maybe you'd like to be financially set before that time. At any rate, pick the year and the income you want to be receiving by that time. You know what Social Security benefits are now, and they'll probably increase, but only along with inflation in the future. And you want the income coming in, whether you're in a condition to work or not, ideally. You want a form of income that does not depend upon your personal services. Now, you know how much you want coming in, and you know the year in which you want it to be there. Your problem is defined, and it's said that a problem defined is half solved. Let's say, too, that that you yearn for the simple, uncluttered life, maybe a small, attractive place in Florida or Southern California or Hawaii or maybe Costa Rica or the coast of Spain with a sailboat and the rest of your life to spend wearing an old pair of Levi's and a sports shirt and sneakers. Sound good? Well, it's quite within the realm of possibility. It's a game any number can play. Most people just don't imagine that it's possible, so they remove themselves from competition. Now, here's one excellent formula to use in helping your imagination come up with the idea that best fits your particular likes and talents. First, the problem or opportunity. Problems are unsolved opportunities. Then assess your education, your background, your qualifications. What do you do best? You may want to go right on doing it, but at the same time, invest your money in something calculated to give you excellent prospects for growth. As our friend suggests in his book, Squeeze the Eagle Until It Grins, you might want to invest in good real estate, perhaps Florida real estate. Then when you're ready to retire, you can live off your income and just watch your investments. You see, with $10,000, you can leverage, oh, 50000 maybe 100000 in real estate. When it grows to $100,000, you can leverage maybe a million or half a million. With a million, you can leverage $10 million. If you're not interested in real estate, remember that each year most people spend 90% or more of their income on products and services. The country's business firms do the same thing. What can you do to earn enough out of all of those many billions of dollars spent every month to live the way you and your spouse want to live? Set aside an hour a day to invest in solving your future financial needs. I recently visited a friend who lives in a beautiful home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He brought out a dozen fine, enlarged, beautiful color photographs of his home and grounds, shots from every angle. There were aerial views showing his home situated on the waterway. We commented on how great they were, and he told us that they'd been taken by a man in a small helicopter who had taken them without my friend's knowledge or permission. He had paid about $200 for the set, and they were well worth the money. If he used them only in case he wanted to sell his house, they'd be worth many times what he paid for them. But in the meantime, they were great, framed in his family room and in his office. A person could make an excellent income doing no more than photographing homes. And if he happened to like living in Florida and flying around in a helicopter, he'd have an agreeable business indeed. It was an imaginative and successful enterprise for a person who likes and is good at photography. Actually, the photographer could be hired while the entrepreneur simply called on the owners of the homes and sold the sets of pictures. But there are thousands of ideas just as good and not nearly so imaginative. Opportunities go with problems. Violent crimes have increased more than 90% in the last five years. Violent juvenile crimes have increased 167% in the last 10 years, according to an article from the Los Angeles Times Service written by David Shaw and Bill Hazlett. We all are sickened by what we read every day in the papers and see on television. What can we do about it? Well, there isn't much the average family can do to change the national situation other than lead honest and exemplary lives themselves. 
But the average family can make certain that its home is as safe as money and good judgment can make it. Now, I'd guess that 90% of American homes are ill-protected against criminal marauders. Any thief or psychopath can enter the average home with ridiculous ease in minutes, and they do every day. And that's because practically all builders put cheap junk where there should be excellent first-class hardware on doors and windows. Now, good hardware is available. You can find it on the really fine, expensive, custom-built homes, but most people don't know about it. Practically all families can afford and would gladly pay for such hardware if someone would bring it to their homes and show it to them, displayed perhaps in an attractive case along with a sales book showing the rate of increase of crime in the country with newspaper clippings of robberies, rapes, and murders going on every day. The man of the house could install the hardware himself, or he could pay extra for your installer to do it for him. And not just for the doors, but for every window in the house. You know, there's window hardware that locks with a key and which prevents a window from being open more than is needed for ventilation. As soon as the would-be intruder finds it difficult to enter, as soon as he realizes he's up against first-class preventive hardware instead of the dime store junk he's used to, he'll move on to easier pickings. Such hardware could be sold in any sizable community. In order to get it for my own home, I had to go to a great deal of trouble, do extensive research, make a couple of trips, and make dozens of phone calls. Whatever it is, you have a knack for, or like very much to do, there's a way to turn it to substantial profit and financial independence. But it takes something that not one person in a thousand will seriously tackle. It takes thought, time set aside for serious thought. Judge Learned Hand once wrote, that we never see, save through a glass darkly, and that at long last we shall succeed only so far as we continue to undertake the intolerable labor of thought that most distasteful of all our activities. But hard as it is, distasteful as it may be, we need only do it until we've solved our own particular problem. And we solve our own particular problem by being of service to others. They have everything we want and will gladly share it with us, as we've said before, if we'll help them solve their problems. As we mature in our adult lives, our income should meet our thoughtful requirements. By establishing quality and simplicity as the guidelines of our lives, the income necessary to live a very good, full life can be surprisingly small. It should meet our qualifications, whatever they are, and that's our business. And any person can see to it that he has the income he wants all the years of his life and lives where he would like most to live. The number of business executives and managers who wind up behind the financial eight ball should be something of a source of amazement to us all. There are professional problem solvers who find they can't solve one of life's most important problems. They're usually good organizers, good leaders, good thinkers, and decision makers. At least they're supposed to be. And when they find themselves living marginal lives on incomes representing only the barest fraction of what they're used to, they should be able to come up with the appropriate answers to their problems. If necessary, they can organize an entirely new business firm, providing some sort of needed product or service. With their experience and training, with all that time on their hands, such an endeavor should have every chance of success. However, should it fail, they'll probably be no worse off than before, and they can try again. It will also give them something exciting to fill their time, keep them in the swim of things. You know, Henry Ford was pushing 50 when he got started in the automobile business. A friend of mine started a brand new company when he was 65, and watched it grow during his lifetime to a $300 million a year institution. In fact, following retirement, it's quite possible for a person to do much better than he did during his regular working career. Today, millions live in cramped, crowded, crime-ridden, polluted cities only because of habit and the failure to use their imaginations. You hear people say, but what if everybody suddenly pulled up stakes and took off to some sunny, agreeable place to live? That's a ridiculous comment. The fact is that not everybody will. Everybody can, but everybody won't. If more people would, we'd see a more rapid decentralization of industry and a resulting better distribution of what's a, now a fairly stable population. The big, ugly cities grew on old trade routes at a time when transportation was limited to water and surface, mostly wagon and then rail transportation. Today, with air and truck transportation what it is, only a few major heavy industries need remain near deep water ports and near supplies of cheap fuel for power. The best estimates today indicate that all known reserves of fossil fuels will be depleted in 150 years. 
With the fusion process now only a matter of time, and with the deuterium supplies and seawater good for at least a billion years at a fraction of the present cost of coal and oil, and with practically no dangerous waste products, we're on the brink of a world revolution of ample power for all of the world's peoples. Moreover, with decentralization of our population away from the crowded cities, we live on 2% of the land, most of us, the industries and businesses which remain can transform those cities into clean, beautiful places in which to live. If you're interested in what can be done to make ugly cities beautiful, send for a marvelous lecture by Victor Gruen, entitled Downfall and Rebirth of City Cores on Both Sides of the Atlantic. Gruen has a plan for redeveloping cities that won him the prize for architecture of the city of Vienna. He says on both sides of the Atlantic, and in fact in all nations of the world, we're presently hell-bent on destroying the environmental qualities of our cities, on spreading them out endlessly into thinly populated suburban regions, and in doing so, destroying every chance for vital, dynamic, multifunctional, meaningful centers. We have succeeded in making the urban environment unlivable and unworkable. We've converted suburban regions into ghettos of sterility and boredom. And in the process, we've destroyed millions of acres of prime agricultural land and natural landscape. He quotes an article which appeared in the New York Times in May of 71, in which a Mr. Eugene Raskin suggested that any effort to improve the functioning of city cores, such as Manhattan, is comparable to the act of beating a dead horse. He said, they are physically obsolete, financially unworkable, crime-ridden, garbage-strewn, polluted, torn by racial conflicts, wallowing in welfare, unemployment, despair, and official corruption. As they exist at present, they are unsalvageable, destined to join the dinosaur in deserved extinction. Urban planners and others who come up with temporary patchwork schemes and gimmicks to keep the cities going another year or two or three are as pathetic as the officers of the Titanic charting tomorrow's course while the water rises above their ears. Those who live in big city areas or in good financial situations make tremendous sacrifices. They have to tolerate unbreathable air, undrinkable water, involuntary waste of time, public insecurity, filthy streets, and the complete severance of any contact with the expressions of nature and fear for their lives and property. Yet in 10 years' time, it is now forecast that 73% of the total population will live in large cities or their environs. The number of cities with over a million inhabitants grows every year and now amounts to a total of 131. The number of those which have populations of between 5 and 10 million is impressive. On the basis of quantitative criteria, the city has never been so successful in the entire history of mankind. On the basis of qualitative criteria, however, the cities of our time are a disastrous failure. No wonder, then, Victor Gruen writes, that everybody wants to escape the densely built-up core areas. The mass use of the automobile, growing incomes, shortened working hours, and extended leisure time encourage the mass flight and make it possible. But just because it is a mass flight, it is also a futile one. Those who want to settle in the lovely countryside must find out, much to their bewilderment, that once the hundreds of thousands of others who are also filled with the same desire have settled, there is no lovely countryside left. And Victor Gruen goes on to point out how city cores can be redeveloped and the countryside can remain beautiful. You can get his entire lecture by just sending a dollar to the Victor Gruen Foundation for Environmental Planning, 315 North Beverly Glen Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90024. But our remaining in such environments will not help them. As Lewis Mumford suggested, each one of us, as long as life stirs in him, may play a part in extricating himself from the power system by asserting his primacy as a person in quiet acts of mental or physical withdrawal. We can beat the problem through that most distasteful of all our activities, the intolerable labor of thought. Thinking with a definite purpose is or should be different from random casual thinking. When you're trying to solve a specific problem, the mind and its largely mysterious powers must be disciplined, directed. During the hour you set aside for thinking, have your major goal before you written at the top of the page of a sheet of paper. Now the mind has to cease its idle playing in the fields and get into harness and go to work. It must come up with possible solutions to the problem before it. It is the transfer agent that must deliver us from where we are to where we've decided we want to be. That may not involve a physical move from one point to another, or it well may. Researchers at UCLA found that for all practical purposes, it appears that the reach of the mind is infinite. And when they say the mind, they're talking about yours and mine. 
As you sit there with your goal before you and begin to try to come up with possible ways of reaching it, you'll notice a very sluggish reaction on the part of your thinking equipment at first. Creative people are familiar with this phenomenon. Like a child resting or at play, the mind resents being called to task and responds sluggishly like oil in sub-zero weather. Usually when it acts that way, most people simply let it go back to sleep. It has learned through many years of inactivity that hard work is not a part of life at all. Here it's important that you stay with it. Like doing push-ups for the first time, not much happens, and the results are disappointing, if not embarrassing. But daily effort soon finds us doing with ease what was at first difficult and awkward. Write down any thoughts the mind passes along. Do not be discouraged, no matter how trivial your first efforts may be, if you haven't done this before. You're prospecting an exceedingly rich soil, and it may come up with a strike the first time out. It isn't likely, but stay alert and examine with great care the ideas produced by your first sessions. Sometimes an idea which appears worthless at first can be turned around or inside out or combined with another idea to form a winner. Just as important as the ideas produced by these first sessions is the extremely important function you're performing. Each day as you look at your goal and begin your disciplined thinking, you're placing the idea of your goal in your subconscious mind. Like the incredibly rich soil it is, it accepts the idea as a seed. Planting the seed once in a single session will probably not plant the seed deep enough or guarantee its germination. The seed must be planted again and again before germination takes place and it begins to grow in the subconscious mind. And while you're trying to pull ideas out of the top of your mind, a far greater wisdom is going to work below the surface. These think sessions accomplish two important jobs. One, they force the mind into disciplined control and form the habit of disciplined thought and produce ideas, some of which may be very good. And two, they plant the seed of your goal deep into your subconscious mind and cause it to germinate and take root. It's the second function that will virtually guarantee your reaching your goal. You may later rue the day, but reach your goal you will. As someone has said, be choosy what it is you set your heart upon, for if you want it strongly enough, you'll get it. Here it all hinges on the wisdom and maturity of our decisions. Then, forcing the mind to think and come up with answers for a definite period of time every day sets the great subterranean forces to work. And they'll go on working all day while you're doing other things and all night long while you're sleeping. That's how you get the real hidden power of your mind and imagination to work. You've given it a specific job to do in the setting of your goal. And it can marshal massive, computer-like memory banks and countless extrapolations and permutations, trying a million possible pieces to the puzzle you've given it. And at the same time, another very subtle action is taking place. You're changing. Subtle shifts in your personality and attitudes, your manner, your whole being are underway as you're being readied for the accomplishment of your goal. And as you think about the goal you're working toward, it moves farther and farther into the realm of possibility. Gradually, instead of being what might at first have seemed like a little wild daydream, it begins to make more and more sense. It begins to take on legitimate concrete form. And finally, one day when you least expect it, when the mind is at leisure, the idea will appear. It will slip into the edge of your consciousness so unobtrusively that like a sly party crasher, you will be only vaguely conscious of it. But then incredibly at first, then with mounting exhilaration, you'll see it for what it is, the idea you've been looking for. And if your goal is to live the simple, uncluttered life in some idyllic spot, you can achieve it. You can have your cake and you can eat it too. You can, through the use of your imagination, do what you want to do, where you want to do it. You are under no constraint other than habit and self-doubt to suffer in one part of your life for success in another part. You can succeed in all parts. For those who are not ready to begin uncomplicating their lives, there are a million things calling for attention, opportunities everywhere. Every listing in the yellow pages of the telephone directory represents a business opportunity because not one of the businesses listed is being operated as well as it can be, as it may one day be operated. At the same time, let's remember those worthwhile guidelines, quality and simplicity. It's really quite surprising what we can do without and still live a richly satisfying life. We've been engaged for some time now in a national debauch of senseless consumerism in this country. Just as we eat twice what we need for good health, we often purchase twice what we need in the way of things, things which end by owning us, tying us down, worrying us as we try to maintain or keep from losing them in one way or another. I think what we're seeking is freedom. Freedom from things 
as well as the opinions of others. It's amazing how people love to complicate their lives. Several years ago, a friend of mine played a trick on his wife that changed her life and his too. Over the years, his wife had formed the habit, and it's an easy one to form for a man or a woman, of shouting at the children in the morning as she tried to herd them off to school. She screamed at them to get up and get dressed, to come to breakfast, to get ready for school, to catch the bus. It was a scene no doubt duplicated in thousands, perhaps millions of homes every morning. But it left my friend John, his wife, and the children pretty badly shaken every morning with nerves jangling and a great desire to get as far from that house as possible in the shortest possible time. Each morning, John found himself heaving a sigh of relief as he left the wild confusion and noise of his home for the relative quiet of the drive to the office. And on one such drive, he got an idea that he felt might help subdue somewhat the nerve-shattering cacophony of his mornings. So the next morning, without his wife's knowledge, John hid a tape recorder and microphone in the kitchen with the volume turned up. All through the frenetic tableau of shouting and imprecations, the silent machine recorded every word, every sound. Then when the children had gone off and his wife was sitting limply in her chair with a cup of coffee getting her breath back from her morning drill master duties, John played it back to her. For a few moments, his wife looked at him in curious amazement. Then she suddenly realized that the strident, shouting, barking, unhappy voice was her own. For the first time, she heard herself as she sounded each morning to her husband and children, her face framed with wounded embarrassment as the awful sound of her own voice again filled the kitchen. And long before it was over, she had put her head in her arms and was crying her heart out. John turned off the tape recorder and put his arm around her. And when she raised her tear-streaked face to look at him, it was filled with resolve. And she said quietly, John, I'll never make another sound like that as long as I live. The next morning, the neighbors must have thought this family had left town. The children were dumbfounded but delighted. Their mother was smiling happily. She spoke to them in normal, well-modulated tones. Everything went off like clockwork. And when the children, still dazed by the smiling stranger who looked like their mother, had left for school, John and his wife sat smiling over their coffee. He later said she told him that she'd never be able to thank him enough for bringing home that tape recorder. The great majority of people haven't the faintest idea of the image they project for the world to see and hear. That's why football coaches show their players the films of the preceding week's game. If you want to improve your golf, get someone to videotape your swing. See yourself as you really look, and you can see where you can improve, or you can perhaps slow down and become steadier, more rhythmical. But if you want to have some fun, surreptitiously record the voices of your family at mealtime. That includes your own. You'll all find it a very interesting experience, and it can be hilariously funny. Some time back, Thomas J. Fleming wrote a piece for Life magazine that had to do with an interview he had with Dr. Frederick J. Godet, director of the Laboratory of Psychological Studies at Stevens Institute of Technology. Dr. Godet is an expert on labor problems and absenteeism. Through his studies, it seems that Dr. Godet has become intimately familiar with germs, their oddities and strange habits. He discovered, for example, that germs can feel and act. He said studies show germs can tell one day of the week from another. They are aware of payroll accounting procedures and can even tell if an employee is happy or not or if a boss is a kind or mean person. The doctor learned all of this while working on the problem of absenteeism which cost the nation something in the neighborhood of seven billion dollars a year. It was discovered, for example, that while humans work a five-day week with the weekend off, germs work just the reverse. Thursdays and Fridays are virtually germ-free days in industry, but the germs really go to work over the weekend and lay low hundreds of thousands of employees who don't show up on Monday. Yet in certain companies, the germs lay low on Thursdays, but go after the employees on Fridays. It was found that these companies paid on Thursday instead of Friday. Another curious fact was noted. Companies with liberal payment policies for absences due to illness had a 50% higher illness rate than companies with restricted sick leave policies. It was also discovered that germs head for the hills when management begins doing some serious research into the cause of illness, and that new employees, on a six-month probationary period, were virtually left alone by germs. But as soon as they were permanently hired, with their jobs secure and their psyches well-adjusted to company routine, the germs suddenly attacked at the same rate that they attacked old-timers in the company. And it was found that germs are passionately attracted to departments and companies with tough bosses constantly breathing down the necks of employees. One large company found that the absences due to illness varied from 2% to 17%, depending upon the type of boss. 
Dr. Goodday also discovered that there's a certain type of person to whom germs are particularly attracted. They're people who are defensive, suspicious, and somewhat hostile. They're usually not well liked by their supervisors, and they reciprocate this dislike. They don't make friends easily and are regarded as loners. It's amazing how often they get sick. On the other hand, germs seem to avoid the sort who make friends easily, are outward going and capable of numerous emotional attachments. These are the people you can depend upon to show up on Monday mornings. They seem to have a built-in germ repellent. And the doctor recommends that we have all-star games, Christmas, New Year's, the World Series, and national elections only on weekends. We know germs are active on weekends, so we have nothing to lose. And it seems that if a company will do a little research into the activities of its germs and the sort of people it has in management positions, it might increase its productivity considerably. Here's a wonderful way to avoid an argument. Simply ask questions. Instead of jumping in and disagreeing before you know any more about the subject under discussion than the other party, ask the other person to state his case specifically and to define his terms. People who like to argue and will at the drop of a word on any subject are people who enjoy ruffling the feelings of others. Willis Sloan once wrote an article entitled Arguments Don't Win Friends, in which he points out that arguments are useless and largely ridiculous. They're more a matter of temper than temperate conversation and discussion. Subjects such as politics and religion can almost always provoke an argument. Racial prejudices can bring forth the most ridiculous statements in the form of arguments for or against certain practices. But if you'll apply this rule... To make your opponent be specific about some point you know backward and forward, you may avoid a foolish and endless, where nobody wins kind of argument. I've found that an argument like a potential highway accident can generally be spotted from some distance away, and it can be avoided the same way. Slow down and approach with caution. In conversation, as in your car, the worst danger is speed. It's pretty hard to get seriously hurt going ten miles an hour, and you can avoid a serious argument that could lead to a lot of heartache by just being extremely careful when you come upon a situation that's likely to erupt into a serious argument. If someone makes a statement that you feel is wrong or ridiculous, you should not remain silent. As you feel the adrenaline pumping into your system, instead of jumping on the other person with both feet, just ask, why do you say that? If you get another absurd generalization, ask, would you mind being specific about that? Ask questions such as why? How do you know? Instead of trying to prove your opponent wrong, make him prove himself right or discredit himself, which he will promptly do if he's skating on thin ice. Put the burden of proof squarely where it belongs, on the shoulders of the person who started it. Then you can sit back calmly and enjoy yourself while he gets in over his head, flounders in the swamp for a while, and finally tries to change the subject. No argument. And he won't be so quick to start another one the next time. Robert McNamara, one of the nation's top executives, asks why, whenever something is proposed, even if he is immediately against the proposal, he wants all the facts. Perhaps he's been wrong about it, and if he's right, he forces the person making the proposal to prove its merits. Now, no one can even guess at the number of families living between arguments in a state of unnecessary and uneasy truce. Since it takes two to argue, let's make sure we're not one of them. All we need say is, why do you say that? Or, exactly what do you mean by what you just said? Where is your proof? Keep the ball and the pressure on the person who is driving recklessly. It works like a charm, and you come out of it looking professional, wise, and level-headed. Thank you.